Well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, 2022 Northeastern IPM Center Research Update Conference. Um, and it, my name is Jana Hexter, and I am happy to welcome you. Well, I'm going to uh, just say a couple of words before we dive into our first uh, video. So um, there, it, this is being recorded, and it will be sent to you in about a week. Um, we do welcome your questions anytime. In fact, we've got lots of times for questions, so please do uh, pipe in with your questions. If you can use the Q&A feature, that would be really helpful. So if you scroll up and you'll see the Zoom bar and there's a little box in the middle that says Q&A. So you can put a question in there and you can also mark it anonymous if you if you would like to. And, um, and I will ask those questions uh, during our Q&A time. If you have comments, feel free to put them in the chat. It's just much harder for me to pick out questions uh, from the chat. Um, and um, so we will, with that, I am going to stop my uh, sharing and we are going to go into our first presentation, which is um, by Jeff Berta. And uh, the title is uh, Queen Project and the HHBBC Field Test Mite Fighting Behavior Using um, Backyard Scientists. And this was uh, funded by Northeast Sarah and Jeff is with Dickinson College. And uh, so here we go. Hey guys, my name is Jeff Berta. I'm with Always Summer Herbs. I live in Pennsylvania, Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania, and I am a member of the Queen Bee Improvement Project, as you can see from my really cool shirt here. And I wanted to talk to you about our SARE grant that we did back in 2018. We had an idea that if we took um, 100 pairs of bees and we gave them out to 100 beekeepers, that we can get them really excited about using better, more resistant genetics and taking some data and actually proving to themselves that genetically resistant bees are better. And, but the big takeaway from my project is, and there's supposed to be one big project takeaway, and that is research is messy. Matter of fact, in this case, research was a disaster. Research went backwards as far as that was concerned. But fortunately, research was not the primary goal of this project. The primary goal of this project was to change attitudes and talent and practices amongst beekeepers, backyard scientists, backyard beekeepers. So I'm gonna to try to share a few things on the screen here. It's gonna be a little clunky, so just bear with me. And I'm gonna share a screen and share and the project name is this. If you go to the Sustainable Agriculture Research Education Projects and you type this in, FNE18-886, you'll see that this is it. And uh, these are really great grants. It involved four different states, seven different bee, bee clubs, and 100 beekeepers, which we have talked about right about... The results, the results. So we had 100 pairs of bees given out, and we only got 24 reports back from those 100 pairs of bees. That's a 24% return rate. But a lot of times these things have return rates of about 10%. When Purdue did it, they had 11. So I just wanted to beat them, and we did. But out of those 24 sets, where only nine of the data sheets were of any use at all because they recorded all kinds of other things besides what we asked them to record. And out of those nine that had results on them, not all the results of all the columns were the same. So it was even more messy. So I had my advisor, we have advisors here, uh, and mine was Margarita Lopez Uribe. And, uh, and we analyzed the data and the thing about it was, um, it, it was it was terrible data. It just did not seem to make any sense. Um, I'm just gonna put this back up. And it actually showed that the control bees chewed more than the Purdue chewing bees because of how complicated it was for people to be able to try to understand what a chewed mite looks like. So the the type of genetics that we were using 
are uh, Purdue mite biters, where the bee actually identifies the Varroa parasitic mite, goes after the mite, chews the legs off, and then the mite will bleed to death because mites don't have clotting factors, so they don't scab over. So we were trying to get them to use these new kind of bees. But we had a really great outreach event where we showed people how to uh, you know, make bee splits and introduce queens and count mites and things like that. So there was just a tremendous amount of chatter um, kind of amongst all the, um, all the bee clubs. And, you know, what it really came down to is we did change some, uh, you know, attitudes, knowledge and skill level. But, you know, the nature of the human being is that we would still rather eat chocolate and watch TV as opposed to going to the gym and having a kale smoothie for dinner. So, you know, they all want to have really nice bees, but they're really not willing to put in the work. But that's just kind of the way us humans are. So without anything further, that's all I have. And have a super fantastic day. Now let's see if I can get this thing stopped in time. No. All right, there we go. I think I've ended it. If you have any questions, I'll be around afterwards, and I hope you had a good time. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'll, uh, I know I'll feel super guilty tonight when I'm eating chocolate and watching TV. So <laughs> I'm eating chocolate right now. <laughs> All right, and we do have a Q and A break after the next video. So the next one coming up is by uh, Nicole Zlotnikov. Oh gosh, um, I can't pronounce this. Asparagopsis, seaweed reduces methane emissions and improves microbiome. And that was, uh, she's from Z Farms Organics and uh, it was funded by Northeast South. So if you can watch that, would be great. And then we'll uh, answer any questions you have. Thank you for letting me present a report on the impact of asparagopsis on methane production and health of the sheep. As shown on the left chart, there are roughly 1 billion sheep in the world. Interestingly, the U.S. has accounts for roughly half of 1%, while China and India represent almost 30% of the population. While sheep rarely get much attention for their impact on greenhouse gases, the chart in the middle highlights an aggregate they produce as much carbon dioxide equivalent as the entire country of Spain. The solution to their methane expulsion problem must also address health impact on the animal, as well as be economically viable. We believe that Asparagopsis taxiformis or red seaweed meets all three criteria. To test this hypothesis, I designed an experiment. We selected 48 sheep, which were randomly assigned to three equal groups. The control group was given no feed additives, while group two and three were given asparagopsis mixed with alpha-alpha equal to 0.25% and 1% of average dry matter intake. The trial lasted six weeks. We took samples at four time points, one week before start of the trial, at the start of the trial, three week and six week point. The sheep were pastured using rotational grazing to assure fresh forage. This slide highlights changes in methane expulsion by sheep over the course of the study. The measurements were performed inside an enclosure using a portable laser methane detector. The test for each animal was performed over a three minute period. The slide on the left illustrates significant drop in the average methane expulsion for the 1% DMI group after just three weeks, which largely persisted into week six. By contrast, 0.25% DMI and control group exhibited no improvement. Interestingly, the chart on the right shows some improvement in the median sheep expulsion for the low dose group, indicating presence of outliers in that cohort or which skewed the average. I examined this in more detail. The number of sheep exhibiting reduction in methane was consistent with random chance for the control group, but improved for both 0.25% and 1% cohorts. Only the improvement for 1% group was statistically significant. Digging deeper into the data, we found that four out of five sheep in the low dose cohort, which did not show improvement in methane, also had unusually high parasite count. Prior studies suggest that there is a link between parasites infestation and methane, which is consistent with our observations. 
Perhaps the most surprising result of the study is the apparent antiparasitic effect of asparagopsis. This observation is critically important to eventual deployment of this feed additive. Parasites are the ultimate enemy of any livestock operation, especially in organic farming where chemical dewormers are not allowed. We note substantial statistically significant reduction in parasites' eggs for both groups using asparagopsis. Admittedly, control group also exhibited some decline due to rotational grazing, but magnitude of decline was lower and not statistically significant. More important than eggs are actual live parasites. So we also looked at the haemunctus hatching rates from cultured samples. Again, asparagopsis appears to have a beneficial impact on parasite reduction. As expected, we saw a rise in coperia, which is a commensal organism with lower pathogenic effect. Sheep weight gain is a critical commercial consideration and an indirect measure of sheep health. We are pleased to see that sheep given asparagopsis gained weight at a higher rate than the control group. This is consistent with observed reduction in parasites, which tend to inhibit weight gain. This is an important and positive consideration in determining economic viability. We also examined each sheep microbiome. While we tested for roughly 35 organisms, results were statistically significant for only three. I was extremely pleased to see a statistically significant decline in the archaea for the high dose cohort. Archaea organisms play an important role in mediating hydrogen absorption, which contributes to methane production. Observed decline has increased confidence in results. We also saw a rise in beneficial beauty vibrio bacteria, as well as statistically significant decline in ruminococcus. Overall, our study corroborated some prior results, which suggested that asparagopsis has a beneficial impact on methane expulsion. However, unlike other studies, we, saw, we found the impact insignificant at 0.25% dose, which we believe may be tied to high parasite load. At higher dose, asparagopsis appears to be substantially reduce archaea ability to produce methane. We're especially excited to find apparent antiparasitic properties, even at a lower dose. We believe this is the first time such results were documented. Combined with observed weight gain, this significantly improves commercial appeal. However, our study was performed on an organic farm and would need to be replicated in a higher volume commercial setting. Finding exact dosing is critical. Finally, we would need to see commitment to this approach. Providing asparagopsis to all the sheep in the world would require us to produce and distribute 3.7 million tons per year, which today is not practical. However, demonstration of benefits in health and parasites can certainly drive incremental adoption. We are extremely grateful to Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, who sponsored this very important project. Their support enabled a more comprehensive analysis of the asparagopsis benefits, which could drive commercially justifiable use with beneficial impact on reduction in methane emissions. Great, thank you very much. And um, we have um, a few questions, a couple of questions. Um, so um, the first is from uh, Audrey Selapak, and she asked a question of Jeff. Uh, she said, Jeff, of course, we know with her that we know hindsight is 2020 with these sorts of projects, especially when depending on the public for reliable data. If you could do the study over again, what would you do differently? And what future research is your team going to do based on the findings of this project? And a corollary question uh, is, what did the deep will be beekeepers have to do to get data to you okay um yeah that was uh that's that's quite an in-depth detailed set of questions there uh what would we do differently well um originally we figured that we were going to get past the problems that purdue had which is where they gave out these cards at one of the bee conferences so what we did is we went and we engaged the clubs individually and gave a presentation to them and we were hoping that kind of through peer pressure that they would all say, okay, well, we need to go out and collect mite data today. Let's, you know, I'll help you and I'll show you what to do. And we had the presidents on board and, you know, we, we were really staying after them, but really getting people to get the data in. 
was, was difficult. Um, another one we tried before was using an app on um, a smartphone, but then you have Android and Apple and people can't get it to work on their particular brand and that wasn't working either. So <clears throat> as far as being able to increase participation, um, the, the answer really is using uh, people who are more seasoned and beekeepers who know what they're doing, but that really wasn't entirely the point of the project because those people are already on board and using, um, you know, genetic stock. So, um, you know, we wanted to get the, the newbies and, um, and try to get them excited about it. And if we use the guys that are all my age, then, you know, we've been doing this work for 10 years and, you know, I don't, I don't need to change their attitude. So, um, my advisor said that if we offered them a Starbucks $5 gift card, that we might get some uh, excitement out of that. So um, I don't think that was a fundable expense for my SARE grant. So, um, but yeah, the, 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 I think there has to be some sort of uh, cherry uh, carrot to try to get them. So whether it's the $5 gift card or we talked about, um, the following year, we would give them uh, one of the good queens that since they're saying, here's, you know, black and white, you know, give us the results. We'll say, we're going to give you the white one. We're going to give you the good one. And that way we're offering them basically a $50 queen uh, for next year's season. So that was, um, that was really our takeaway on how to improve participation. Um, but uh, what was the second question? Uh, what did the beekeepers have to do to get the data for you or to you? Oh, we gave them all a, um, uh, we, we gave them a paper uh, sheet. We gave them an Excel uh, form to fill out um, and they could email it to me. We had everybody's email address. We sent all the forms out. Um, you know, everyone said they downloaded them. We passed them out at meetings. And uh, one club in West Virginia did a, a fabulous job. It was mainly because the president, you know, really put all the data together and sent it to me. But all the onesies and twosies, uh, one of the biggest clubs in, um, in Pennsylvania, the Berg Bees, and, and these guys have, when I go there, there's like so many college degrees in the room that I'm always afraid to talk to them. And they're so technically proficient. We even had a guy who was like a tech guy that did surveys for a living and we still couldn't get it out of them. That was like 38 sets of Queens and we only got like two reports back and they had the highest tech as far as trying to send out survey monkeys to get the results back. Um, so, you know, so they could, I had like two that they mailed to me and then all the rest of them came through emails. You know what it reminds me of? There was something in the news a couple of months ago uh, that someone did a study about what would incentivize people to go to the gym. And it was something like one cents or five cents. And it was, but it was tied into something with the value of what they were offering was really small, like five cents, but it was something to do with like a Starbucks card. So I'm just thinking that rings true. So mini eggs, <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> All right, well, we need to move on to stay on track. I have one question um, for Nicole, which I think we have time for in, the, in a minute. Um, so it is, uh, where is asparagopsis uh, native and are there issues with harvest processing, possibly uh, with growing it in other parts of the world? Asparagopsis taxiformis and other variety, Asparagopsis armata, they grow wild in the wild. They're red marine seaweed and uh, they grow in Pacific. First study was done next to the coast of Australia by Melbourne University. There were many studies uh, from Atlantic grown, uh, uh, wild uh, um, Asparagopsis from Atlantic coast next to Spain, next to Ireland. And uh, so interestingly enough, it is invasive species somewhere. So it's actually goes well, but of course harvesting wild seaweed, it's kind of logistics might be a little bit difficult. The Asparagopsis, which we used for this study was grown on the seaweed farm, which was located in, um, 
in um, Hawaii in the United States and they grow it on the beaches and they have special watts um, where they actually, they collect it in the wild, but they propagate it in the vats and try to commercialize it, the growth. It's uh, very important actually to standardize growth because the active substance, which actually um, reduces methane is a bromoform. So the concentration of bromoform varies widely between species of growth in different locations. So the one that we used has the highest concentration of bromoform because it was selected for that. It has 12, 12% of active compound as opposed to say 6% or 3% in the previous studies done that were done in Australia and in Spain. So yeah, as a processing is very important because dry heating actually kills the compound. There were studies done from China maybe also seven years ago and they were using dry heated asparagopsis. And um, of course, concentration that they gave to the, to the sheep was different. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's very important. The processing, the harvesting, it's, it's important for, for, the, for the research, that it's standardized and it's kind of uniform. Great. Okay, thank you. And we will move along. Uh, so our next presentation is by Quan Zeng, and it is entry points for the fire blight pathogenic pathogen Awinia amelivora on apple leaves. It was funded by the Northeastern IPM Center and um, Quan Zeng is with the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And here we go. How does the fire blight pathogen Awinia amelivora enter apple leaves? Awinia amelivora is a bacterial pathogen that causes fire blight disease on apples and other rosaceous plants. Shoot blight that occurs usually between May and July in the Northeast is an important phase of fire blight where the pathogen from woods droplets can cause new infections through tender young leaves. It is previously believed that Avenia milivora enters shoots through wounds caused by wind, blowing sand, and insects. So in this research, we are interested to understand um, after Awinia amelivora arrives to the tender young apple leaves, uh, where do they grow epiphytically and through which leaf structures do they enter into the apple leaves? To answer these questions, uh, we constructed an Awinia amelivora strain with the GAS gene integrated into the chromosome, which allows us to uh, visually track Awinia amelivora colonization by observing the blue color after the gas staining. From um, at the initial stage of infection, we can see that the two structures that turn blue are the non-glandular trichomes, as also called the leaf hair, or the glandular trichomes along the leaf serration and also along the leaf vein. The um, blue colored non-glandular trichomes are concentrated mostly along the vein and also along the leaf edge. At a later stage of infection, we can see a clear internalization of the blue color from simply the edge of the leaf serration into the internal parts of the leaves and ultimately leading into the vein. Um, blue colors were observed uh, in the internal tissues of the leaves immediately adjacent to the glandular trichomes along the leaf serration and also along the vein where lots of those non-glandular trichomes uh, are found are present. Using a green, green fluorescent labeled Avenia milvara strain and confocal microscopy, we can clearly observe the uh, Avenia milvara colonization is concentrated at the junction between the glandular trichome and the leaf serration. Also, we observed such colonization on the surface of the non-glandular trichomes and with the concentration of those Avenia amylivora cells at the junction of the non-glandular trichomes into the leaf surface. We observed that the glandular and non-glandular trichomes are naturally lost during the leaf development. As we can see on the left panel, those glandular trichomes are breaking off from the leaf serration as the leaf grow older. Similar to the glandular trichomes, 
The non-glandular trichomes were also observed to be naturally lost during the leaf development as we can see the rupture at the base of the non-glandular trichome as well as the uh, rupture hole after the non-glandular trichome is gone. In conclusion, here we show that Avenia avulovora grows epiphytically on two important structures, the glandular and non-glandular trichomes on apple leaves uh, during the shoot by uh, stage of infection. We found that glandular and non-glandular trichomes naturally fall off as apple leaves mature, during which the ruptures at the basis of such structures create those natural injuries. And it is through such injuries Avenia amylovora enter the leaves and, and cause infection at the leaf edges and on the veins du and during the shoot blight stage of infection. And finally, we found that uh, the uh, external factors such as wind, rain, and insects um, are not generally not required for a winning amylovora to enter the leaves, although they may facilitate such infection by creating additional uh, wounds for a winia to come through. And this is an addition to the current understanding of shoot blight as we generally believe wounds are required and insects and those wind and rain are important for a winia to come through during the shoot blight. Great, thank you, Quan Zhang, and we'll have questions for uh, Quan after we've watched um, Erica Mactinger's presentation on biological control options for fly control in poultry fa uh, facilities. Um, Erica is with the Pennsylvania State University, and this project was funded by Northeast Sahara. It seems like some people are having problems um, putting questions into the Q&A, so I'll do my best to follow the chat as well if you're one of those people. So, okay. So I'm really excited to be giving some highlights of our research that was funded by SARE and it's wrapping up this year, looking at biological control methods for houseflies in poultry facilities. So what's the big deal with flies? So other than the nuisance factor, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, the main issue is actually pathogen transmission. So houseflies and, and other flies on poultry facilities can transmit pathogens that can be a real problem, including salmonella and E. coli, potentially avian influenza, which is of concern right now, as some areas are experiencing high path avian influenza outbreaks. Now, the risk of, risk of pathogen transmission has resulted in the FDA egg rule, which requires producers with 3,000 or more birds to actually monitor and control flies. And how do we know flies are a problem? Because producers have told us. So over 77% of Pennsylvania poultry producers have listed flies as a major pest of concern. And unfortunately, it's actually not easy to control these pest flies. For organic farmers are kind of handcuffed by what products they can use, and the entire industry is concerned with animal welfare. But the biggest concern is the overuse of pesticides in the last few decades, which means that the go-to insecticides that have been used for fly control are no longer as effective as they have been. So biological control is a method that can be used against flies. It's organic friendly, fits right into our IPM pyramid. And there are three primary methods of biological control for flies. They include parasitoids, predators, and entomopathogenic fungi. Now, predators are a little bit limited because there aren't many suppliers that have them and they do tend to be generalists, but parasitoids and entomopathogenic fungi are options that can be used and are available commercially. However, there's only one product currently available uh, that has the fungus Bouveria bassiana in it uh, for poultry farms, and it really isn't that effective. Now, Bouveria can be found in many different insects and often is isolated from insects that are not flies. And the general idea is if you isolate the fungus from your pest of interest in the environment it's going to be in, it may be more effective than other Bouverias from other uh, pest insects. But you do need to also make sure that it's compatible with other biological control agents like parasitoids. So our broad umbrella objectives were to see if we could find new strains of Bouveria bastiana from house flies and evaluate if they're better at killing those flies and safe for parasitoid natural enemies. And we also created a short course in poultry pest management focused on IPM to help producers get away from uh, constant chemical use. 
So looking at the first research component, we collected flies from seven different farms weekly throughout the summer. Overall, we collected over 5,000 flies and only five of those flies tested positive for Bouveria. And these samples actually came from two different sites. Now this is not tip, this is not atypical for Bouveria. They tend to have uh, infections pretty low. So what does it mean? Basically, you can find Bouveria isolated from house flies in these environments, but if you're trying to do surveillance or looking for new strains, that probably needs to be pretty extensive to make sure you come up with uh, a positive sample. So we tested these strains against house flies and three species of parasitoids that are available commercially, and we found that the house fly specific isolate P5 kills flies two times faster than the control, which was obviously not a fungus. And it was very similar to the L90 strain, which was collected from flies in the 1990s. And all of our house flies collected strains were better than the GHA strain, which is a commercially available strain uh, that was collected from a greenhouse pest. Testing against parasitoids, yeah, it did reduce daily survival of parasitoids uh, by one and a half to two days in Splangia cameroni, one to one and a half days in Splangia endius, and two days in Muscadifurax raptor. So basically, yeah, not very good, but very reduced parasitoid lifespan. However, Bouveria could target adult housefly locations and not immature areas where parasitoids would likely be, so you could reduce this potential interaction. So looking at the education side of it, we wanted to create a short course in poultry pest management that was hosted at Penn State Extension. And we did, we created over 10 hours of video content. It was launched in the spring of last year and we had 50 registrants for the synchronized version. So that was connected to me answering questions and guiding folks through it. Uh, the course was set up so the videos were on the landing page and each subsection was followed by a check your learning quiz. There was a final section quiz that had to be completed for um, passing the course. And we also had a section of handouts that included a reference guide, two different chemical options to help with rotation, uh, and a fillable IPM plan. And we also had a reference guide to biological control products that are currently available. So I encourage anyone to reach out to me if you have any questions about this research, and I thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so we have uh, one question for each of our presenters. Uh, so Jason uh, asked, said, Quan, nice job and amazing images. Can you speculate about whether most disease is coming through uh, trichomes or is um, more coming in through injuries? Uh, that's a good question. So. Um... We are um, currently using apple trees that are um, um, grown in the uh, growth chamber conditions where we don't expect any external disturbance to the leaves, uh, no wind, no rain, no insects. Thus, we think it's like uh, anything that happens on the leaves are naturally occurring. So we see that the, um, the entry through those uh, broken trichomes um, and leaf hair uh, are simply the leaves are fall, uh, having those structures gradually fall off during the leaf development. Um, this summer, however, we are uh, planning to set up an experiment where we will compare apple uh, leaves uh, that are um, blown by a big fan to um, mimic the uh, gusty wind versus apple trees that are completely uh, kept under the growth chamber conditions and see um, whether additional disturbance of a gusty wind would cause more uh, structures to fall off and if such uh, impact would cause more infection. Thank you. And there's a question for um, from Chang Lu for um, Erica. How did you examine the presence of Bavaria bassania from 5,000 fly samples? Yes, that's an excellent question, especially since these are called filth flies and they hang around manure areas where there's going to be a lot of microorganisms that may not be Bavaria. Um, so when we brought them back in the field, we waited, uh, they were held in cages for a period of time 
and flies that died were then surface sterilized and held in petri dishes with high humidity and we waited for a fungal bloom and bavaria has a pretty distinctive fungal bloom i mean you can't identify it by it just being white and fluffy but it, we could we could narrow down the flies that were candidates based on that fungal bloom and then we um took samples from that and sequenced it and were able to uh, to sequence it out as bavaria great great wonderful thank you all right, we'll move on. We have other questions, but um, we need to keep going on this. So <laughs> we'll move on if we have time for the questions. Uh, I will ask them later. So our next presentation is by Anna Wallingford. It's Attract and Kill Strategies for Sustainable Striped Cucumber Beetle Management. It's an EIPM uh, funded project and Anna is with the University of New Hampshire. Hello, everyone. I wanted to update you on a Northeast SARE funded project, Attracting Kill Strategies for Sustainable Striped Cucumber Beetle Management. My name is Anna Wallingford. You can find my email address there. This is a collaboration between me and the University of New Hampshire, University of Vermont, and um, Agricultural Research Service down in Beltsville, Maryland. But I also want to acknowledge all of the other collaborators because there's other people working on other projects that have to do with this. We're doing an excellent job of coordinating that and it's worth pointing out. But with some background, we're looking at striped cucumber beetle. Um, this is the beetle in question. They will feed on leaves, which can kill transplants or result in indirect yield losses. Um, they can scar fruit, watermelons and other melons tend to be more susceptible there. Um, and they also carry the causal pathogen for bacterial wilt, which tends to affect cucumbers the most. You'll see wilting plants um, and that can kill susceptible crops. Some life history, they overwinter as adults, emerge to feed on pollen and nectar, um, and then when they're ready to settle down and start a family, they move into cucurbits. Um, there is a co-evolutionary relationship with cucurbits, so not only can they tolerate these bitter compounds, um, they use it to stimulate their own feeding, and it tells it that it's its host. They'll also produce a male-produced aggregation pheromone called vetatolactone, so we call it aggregation pheromone because it's attractive to males and females. And so once they settle down, start that family, their larvae will feed on the roots and emerge as adults in the summer. So we see two big peaks um, each year. Um, how does this fit into cucurbit IPM in the Northeast? We typically see farmers use neonicotinoid treated seeds followed by regular fungicide applications with the occasional pyrethroid or some kind of broad spectrum neurotoxin thrown in. Um, organic systems don't have as many tools. They tend to rely pretty heavily on row cover, um, keeping that crop covered for early season intervention, and then they are removed for pollinator access. Um, just to show you a little picture of a cute bee butt, this is for the most part a pollinated crop, so removing um, risks to non-targets is a priority. So how can we integrate behavior um, into those chemical controls to either reduce that non-target effect or, or reduce our use of chemicals in the system entirely? So we know that they are attracted to flowering crops. So the color and the odor of flowers is important in understanding behavior, um, and that has been used in mass trapping approaches, um, have been moderately successful. Um, we know that there's some history of trap cropping, so keeping that, that beetle population on uh, the border as they move into plots. There's some success there. Um, and there's also some um, success with using feeding stimulants as a way to reduce non-target effects, to reduce the AI in a foliar application or exclude non-targets. So that's kind of the lead in to our goal, which is to develop a system of, of attract and kill for this system. We've been playing around a little bit with um, sticky cards with lures attached, attached to them. Um, this is a bull weevil trap that's visually attractive um, as well with, with a little lure. These are primarily used experiment, uh, experimentally. We're, we're playing around with bait stations too. One thing that's really interesting that we've learned during the course of this project is phthalolactone is attractive to spotted cucumber and squash bug. This is a big standout thing. So there's some eavesdropping going on. These two unrelated species are listening in chemically to the aggregation pheromone, that's exciting. Um, in a nutshell, we are looking at 
um, achieving the same control as demonstrated with trap cropping or, or other conventional approaches. So once you take all of these components together, put them into a bait station, you can see these bait stations laid out right before we're planting a plot. Um, so breaking that down, we're looking at evaluating the influence of early season interventions on season long populations. So if you put these bait stations out, plant that crop, um, remove as many beetles as you can from, from the system as possible, does that have long term impacts? On, on crop quality. Um, we're investigating the residual life of bait components, both the cucurbitacin and the spinosad are UV sensitive. So what can we do to improve that? Uh, we're also investigating vicinity effects around those bait stations. So are you making it worse around those bait stations? Uh, we're developing a feeding stimulant to see if we can reduce pesticide rates and protect pollinators by excluding them and integrating all of this into existing programs uh, with the help of commercial farmers. So with that, I wanna thank everybody that's involved including Trace A and New Hampshire Paper Tube, who donated some materials to this project. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, we'll go to our next presentation before we do Q&A. Um, so Tyler Lesko is presenting on flavonoids for resistance against plant pests. It was funded by ARDP uh, and uh, Tyler's with the Pennsylvania State University. Hello, everybody. My name is Tyler Lesko. I'm a graduate student in the Pennsylvania State University the Department of Plant Science, and today I will be talking to you about flavonoids for resistance against plant pests. So a brief overview of flavonoids. These are secondary metabolites produced by plants. They have a variety of roles. Some of the more prominent are pigmentation that can attract pollinators, regulating cell growth, UV protection, and most interesting to me, potential pesticidal properties. Now they're hydroxylated polyphenolics. They have this basic three carbon ring structure, two phenol rings, and then this heterocyclic ring with an embedded oxygen. And depending on what's being done to this C ring here, you can get a variety of subclasses. Now our lab focuses on maize and sorghum. So that is what I'll be talking about. This image here is actually the biosynthetic pathway of flavonoid production in maize. Now, my goal is to extract these compounds and then test them as a biopesticide. Where I start with this ground material, this is from the leaf of sorghum, and this is from the leaf sheath of sorghum. You can see the higher chlorophyll content makes it greener. And I end up with this red to orangish colored extract at the end, depending on the concentration of individual flavonoids. As well as sorghum, we've been testing on maize lines with different compound production. So these are near isonogenic lines that produce, in this case, only one of a specific flavonoid. And then this, quote, D line produces several flavonoids together. This one does not produce any. So I take that and then I will be testing it on a very problematic pest of maize. So if you've grown maize, you've probably heard of fall armyworm. It's this polyphagous insect with a very wide host range. However, it prefers cereals. It's native to the Americas. However, it's become invasive to Africa and Asia, causing problems. Now, these insects will attack the plant at any stage. And they have a voracious feeding habit, especially in the later instars, to where you can see fields completely destroyed overnight sometimes if the infestation is bad enough. Now, they are a little problematic to control because they have this feeding pattern of horal feeding in maize. So they'll bury themselves in the horal so it's hard to get a good insecticidal contact on them. And whenever they really damage the horal, the maize plant is essentially stunted. It, it cannot grow further depending on the extent of damage. Now, our lab has shown these compounds to be effective against other pests previously, including corn leaf aphid. So what I wanted to do was add these extracts to an artificial diet and then feed this diet to these caterpillars. And what I had found after nine days of feeding that the extract at a higher concentration, so this is at 10 milligrams of the flavonoid per milliliter of diet, significantly decreased body weight um, compared to the control, and it significantly increased mortality up from 
between 10 and 20 percent from the control to two micrograms all the way up to 80 percent at 10 micrograms and then at 20 all the insects tested were killed so we definitely see these compounds have bioactive properties against fall armyworm like we had saw with previous pests so what we want to do now is then take this extract and fractionate it, so separate it to see what exactly is in there, and then take those fractions and test them to determine the lethal dose 50 for neonates and then the larger instar because you'll likely have different concentrations based off the, the instars. And then we are currently working on identifying the modes of action for these compounds because they likely have several modes of action which could promote them as being more resilient against insecticide insect resistance um yeah so that thank you for listening uh to my presentation and have a good day Wonderful, thank you. I acknowledge, by the way, it looks like we're running five minutes behind, but we're actually not because we switched out a presentation from earlier to the beginning. So, um, so uh, Jason uh, had a, has a question for Tyler. He says, "Fascinating research. What are some of the more likely modes of action?" Yeah, that's a good question. So there are a couple hypotheses floating around. Um, the ones that we are specifically looking at is the disruption of the gut lining of the caterpillars causing this quote leaky gut syndrome so the gut contents flowing out into the rest of the insect causing septicemia and then we're also looking at disruption of the microbiome itself so there's been a lot of research going into gut microbes being able to increase the nutri nutrition content of plant material because it's helping to break down stuff that the caterpillar maybe doesn't have the enzymes to do itself. So um, these some of these flavonoids have been shown to be antimicrobial, so they could be either completely wiping out certain genus species that are necessary to help the caterpillar get these nutri nutrients, or it could be promoting um, promoting microbes that are able to break down these flavonoids themselves into other metabolites that could be having like downstream effects later on. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, Amara, you had a question, I believe, for um, Erica. Do you want to ask that yourself? I'm not seeing Amara. So, okay, maybe Amara can't speak, so I will. Um, do you feel that the faster death of flies with the PSU5 strain? Um, of uh, bacteria bassiana compared to GHA would warrant considering commercializing the strain for chicken houses. Yes, and that's where we're headed right now. Commercialization um, can be a bit challenging, but the idea was that we'd, we'd basically put in the legwork to find something that worked better. Uh, so we could have a product specifically for poultry or other livestock facilities uh, that, that did target flies better, so. Okay, great. Um, okay, I think we'll move forward. We do have a couple of other uh, questions, but um, we have more Q&A breaks, so this will keep us on track. So uh, the next presentation is by Sam Anderson, Two Spotted Spider Mite IPM for Urban Agriculture. Uh, Sam is with Cornell Cooperative Extension, and um, this was funded by Northeast SA. Hello, my name is Sam Anderson. I'm an urban agriculture specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension. I'm based in New York City, and um, a lot of my work is on uh, integrated pest management for vegetable farms in, um, within New York City. Uh, today, I'll talk about two-spotted spider mite IPM for urban agriculture. So two-spotted spider mite is by far the top pest of tomatoes in New York City, not just in greenhouse settings, but in outdoor uh, plantings as well, which is the majority of the farms here. Um, and it is also a, um, a significant pest uh, of cucumbers um, and sometimes eggplant and beans and localized on some other crops. Uh, but tomatoes are, are where we see the, the largest amount of damage. Um, 
at over 75% of sites um, that I, where I was scouting for two spotted spider mite, there was significant damage in tomatoes or cucumbers um, late in the season over the last three years. So over 75% of sites had an, enough damage that it was definitely increased or uh, decreasing yields. And it's uh, very common for farms here to wind down tomato production by September. Um, and it turns out that is usually, and that was the case that when I started this job um, almost five years ago and discovered that's mostly because of two spotted spider mite. This is what uh, uh, tomatoes can look like late in the season here. Um, basically, the, this is damage that, you know, we can't really come back from this. And that's a uh, two spotted spider mite damage late in the season. So why is it so damaging on urban farms? Um, it's not very that much of an issue to spot it, spider mite. It's not that much of an issue on outdoor tomatoes or cucumbers in our region. Um, it's an issue in similar plantings in that you know fields in the south, but uh, in the northeast, it's not supposed to be this kind of an issue, except for in greenhouses. So why is it so damaging on urban farms in New York City? Um, maybe the urban heat island effect. Our nighttime temperatures are five to seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer than uh, a little bit outside the city. Uh, it could also be because of our lack of natural enemies. Um, I don't know which ones necessarily, but th these are just questions that are still unanswered. Um, and then, uh, and then I've also been thinking about what you know, what are the management strategies that would be effective and and readily adopted on urban farms where there are some limitations, especially um, uh, a, a desire and often a need to to minimize uh, the use of pesticides and definitely to to um, limit to organic materials or OMRI approved. So I got a SARE partnership grant to work on this, um, which uh, wrapped up last year. The big um, big takeaways from it being to, uh, um, or big uh, you know, central points of the project to implement a scouting protocol and to um, a lot of really just outreach and awareness of, about two-spotted spider mite. Um, before starting this grant, urban farmers and, and I also didn't know all that much about two-spotted spider mite because it was, again, theoretically is not supposed to be a problem in, in tomatoes like this in, in our region um, to the extent that it is. So a lot of scouting and, and working on that. Um, we also tried releasing some biocontrols, saw some promise with, with persimilis and attracting natural enemies. Um, the part that I wanna just quickly talk about now is um, one thing that we, that we learned was, was we got a better visualization for how uh, spider mite spreads throughout a tomato planting, at least in these settings. Uh, so this will be using a visual damage score where I would uh, scout the same spots, um, the same points in a, in a planting um, several times during the year and a zero to nine score uh, based on visual damage from spider mite, where zero means no mite is present and nine means that the plant is completely dead. So um, each of these six boxes, um, smaller six white boxes shows that this is an aerial view of a tomato planting. Each of those shows that uh, the spider mite has not appeared yet. A light green box shows that it's present but not very damaging. And then yellow getting into the darker brown shows that it's increasingly damaging levels. So mid-July hadn't showed up yet. By early August, it was there. It seemed to be worse on the, on the edges. So it might have um, come into the field from both edges. And by early September, there is essentially a lost crop. Another farm that same year, the first spot we saw it was actually in the middle of the planting, not at the edges. So uh, spider mite can disperse by wind. So this is a thing that, that we see happen as well. Um, and you can see how it, it appears to have really spread from that one point. So you have a, a sort of, you know, a hot spot that's, that's sort of the patient zero. And uh, another, another farm or the following year, again, mid-July, it first shows up. From there, it spreads throughout the planting. By September, they pulled out the gray boxes, means they pulled out those plants um, because of, of spider mite damage. So the basically what that means in terms of strategy is that it tells us, um, it, it underlines that the importance of scouting um, and our timeline here being that we should start in June, um, scouting weekly, ideally even more often, but scouting regularly and uh, and at the moment that, that you see signs of two spider spider mite to make the call and order for stimulus, which uh, appears to be the most promising biocontrol option, certainly in, in, in a response situation like this, but you gotta use it right away 
And so make the call for Prosumulus as soon as it arrives, release it at that same place um, where you saw the spider mite. And, uh, and potentially before, before releasing Prosumulus, you could also try spraying horticultural soaps or oils or, or another um, organic um, pesticide in that, in that area. And there's some other strategies to think about as well, but I, you know, with, I don't really have time to get into them on, the, on this talk. So um, I think that, that to me was maybe the most interesting takeaway was, was underlining that, that strategy of scouting and finding a hot spot and targeting that spot. And so I'll stop there. And uh, if you have questions or, or any other thoughts or anything that's worked for you, I'd love to hear it. Uh, and I look forward to uh, and, uh, catching up in the chat. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, and I think what we're going to do is uh, we're going on to Chang Lu next, and then we'll also uh, watch Jason Smith's presentation. We'll do three uh, to put us back into uh, the, uh, the agenda. So our next presentation is by Chang Lu Wang, and it's assessing and controlling house mouse infestations in multifamily dwellings. Um, it was funded by the Northeast IPM Center, and Chang Lu is with Rutgers University. Hello, my name is Chang Lu Wang from Rutgers University. Today, I will discuss assessing and controlling house mouse infestations in multi-family dwellings. House mouse is the number two most important urban pest in terms of the relative abundance. In a recent survey, we found that 20% of the apartments in low-income housing had house mouse infestations. The prevalence of house mouse in the urban setting is a result of a lack of awareness and also the ineffective control methods and the policies. In this study, we wanted to study the residents' awareness of rodent infestations, the effectiveness of non-toxic non food base for detection, the effectiveness of a rodent control program that consists of baiting and trapping, and the spatial distribution of house moss infestations in buildings. In this study, we selected the four cities and we installed the rodent bait stations in each apartment to detect rodent infestations. We also conducted a resident interview. In each station, we placed two different blank base plus chocolate spread. After identifying the infestations, we placed first strike and the contract rodenticides in Trenton and Linden sites, so two buildings. This was conducted for two months period. At the end, we placed the snap traps to detect additional uh, rodent activities and also as additional method to control the rodents. From the results, we found that only 42% of the residents were aware of the presence of house mouse infestations and 56% of the residents falsely believed they had the house mouse infestations. Among the three different uh, food items, we found chocolate spread is the most palatable bait for detecting rodent infestations. The effectiveness of the treatment program is shown here. At the end of 10 weeks, there was an 80% reduction in the number of infestations. However, after 12 months, trending sites had a 26% increase in the rodent activities, indicating the treatment program is only short-term, doesn't have a long-term effect. This diagram shows the spatial distribution of the house mouse infestations in Trenton building at zero months and one year period. The blue bars shows the house mouse infested units. You can clearly see that when one apartment is infested, the neighboring units sharing a wall more likely to be infested. So in this study, we found Residents' complaints are not a reliable indicator of rodent infestations. And the chocolate spread is more effective than leaf attack 
and more effective than DTAC soft for detecting rodent infestations. Among the two rodenticides, first strike is better than contract assault. Baiting and trapping only caused a high reduction in house mouse activities only for short term. And lastly, house mouse infestations are spatially correlated in apartment buildings. I thank uh, the Northeastern IPM Center for sponsoring this product, uh, project. And for more information, contact me at uh, Changlu W at Project Study View. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, we'll go on to Jason Smith's uh, presentation um, and then we'll do some Q&A. So his presentation is, oh crap, pasture dragging fails to suppress face flies and horn flies in Pennsylvania pastures. Um, and uh, this was funded by Northeast SARE. Uh, Jason is with um, the University of Maryland and it looks like also the Milton Hershey School of Dickinson College. Wake up everybody. It's time for that crappy fly talk. I'm Jason Smith. I'm gonna share with you insights from research on whether pasture dragging can suppress face flies and horn flies in Pennsylvania pastures. This is research done in collaboration with my colleague, Matt Steinman from Dickinson College. If you've stepped into a cattle pasture lately, you've probably seen the flies there. The cows are certainly not alone. There's horn flies feeding on their blood 20 times a day each and causing massive economic losses to the beef industry. There's also face flies feeding on mucus secretions from the eyes and noses of cows. They transmit diseases. It's no surprise my colleagues at the Dickinson College Farm asked about control measures that would help suppress these two pests. And specifically, we wanted to know, does pasture dragging suppress flies? To understand how that works, you need to know more about their life cycle. Horn flies and, and face flies lay their eggs only in fresh manure. And then their larvae feed and grow in there for about seven days before they pupate. This gives us a really nice window of opportunity to disrupt the life cycle. That idea actually you can find in literature throughout the past century. Like this article, Tools to Win the War Against Cattle Flies, or this USDA pamphlet from 1940 suggesting that if you drag brush or spike tooth harrow over the pasture and break up the droppings, this could permit the droppings to dry out quickly. And here's the key, that would destroy the larvae contained therein. This is a great hypothesis, but it's just a hypothesis for now because folks, there's no published data on whether this works. That leads me to the experiment I'm sharing with you today. We measured the emergence of flies from undisturbed manure, that would be our controls, and from pasture dragged manure to find out if dragging actually suppresses the flies. We were intentional about dragging the manure within two days of when it was deposited in the field to make sure we were allowing it to, to dry out while the flies were still in their larval stage. Then after waiting a week for the flies to pupate, we covered the manure and the area around it with these screen emergence traps. The traps funneled the flies up into a jar where we could collect them, identify them and count them. That gave us the data to answer our important question. And what did we learn? Folks, the flies were not suppressed by the drag. Horn flies, face flies, other flies, none of the differences that we saw in the data were statistically significant. Which led us to ask, was our pasture drag simply not good enough? When we measured the area of manure pats that were spread, they did increase in area, but only about 50%. One could imagine maybe if our drag was better, we'd see better results. So the next year we decided to set aside the drag and take a measure that would ensure we had really good spreading of the manure. We repeated the experiment, only this time we used a handheld plaster spreader to spread the manure out to either double or triple the area of the original cow path. Folks, again, the flies were not suppressed by the spreading. Actually, if you look closely at the center part of my data, you'll see that there were more face flies 
emerging from the manure that had been tripled in area, which is the opposite effect of what we were looking for. We did this experiment in four rounds in 2020, and you can see that on two of those rounds, we had a significant increase in face fly emergence. So what are our big takeaways? Well, there's still no evidence to support pasture dragging for fly control in Pennsylvania, or even in the Northeast where the climate would be similar. And manure spreading appears to promote face flies. Is it possible that the flies are laying eggs in the manure after we've scraped off the crust? And finally, dragging for fly control should be evaluated in climates where manure dries faster. Who knows, maybe it'll work better in the South. This research and more details will be available soon in a publication that's under review by the Journal of Medical and Veterinary Entomology. I'd like to thank Northeast SARE for funding our research and you for your attention. And I'd be glad to answer any questions at the break. Thanks. Great, thank you. I was wondering whose summer job it was to go around spreading uh, cow manure. <laughs> Um, all right, so we have a couple of questions uh, from our last presentations. Um, for a question for Sam from Jason is, how well do predatory mites navigate uh, the tomato trichomes? That is a very good question. Um, so, the, so the trichomes on the leaves are one of the things that are everyone has been telling me was one of the reasons that we were having potential reasons, maybe the reason that we we're having so much trouble on tomatoes and, and cucumbers specifically, that a lot of um, the native predators have trouble with navigating the trichomes. Um, and that does seem to bear out in terms of what I've been seeing on the leaves. Persimilis particularly, so out of the three kinds we released, two of them didn't get enough good information to scouting it um, to, for those who couldn't find any evidence of them um, getting established on the tomatoes, but uh, Persimilis, which is the um, a specialized predator of two-spotted spider mite and the one used most often in greenhouses, um, does seem to navigate the leaves well. Now, I didn't see a lot of great evidence of this in my own scouting. I just didn't have time to scout thoroughly enough to um, to sort of, you know, follow that. But um, but that's one of the advantages of Persimilis is that it does a better job than, than most of, of navigating it. And it navigates well on, on the, the webbing. Once spider mites start to um, produce webbing, it actually is adapted specifically to navigate along the, the threads. Um, okay. Great. And another question for you, Sam. Do the costs of biological control and horticultural oil work out for urban farming? So, we didn't get into a lot of depth on that, but that was one of the big questions all along. Um, as far as biocontrols, one of, so again, two of them, we didn't get good evidence that they really established. One of them also we determined was too, was probably too expensive. So um, Neosimos fallaces is, is, a, is a predatory mite. That one, we just couldn't get it established yet. Um, and uh, uh, Feltiella carasuga, which is a predatory midge, uh, that one cost quite a bit more and we couldn't, you couldn't justify the cost for it to, you know, to recommend it to urban farmers. It's something like seventy-five dollars for, for a little packet for it, and um, and yeah, it didn't see enough effectiveness. Um, Persimilis is not that so. In this, some of the reasons that we focus on it as well, it's not that expensive. Uh, less than twenty bucks for a bottle of I can't remember how many hundred, but quite a few. Um, you can for fifty bucks you can get enough that most of the urban farms here can get enough to cover all of the tomatoes easily. Um, and so it's, it, it, not everyone's going to want to do that, but, um, some farms this year, now that I don't have the money to, to buy it for them, um, have decided to try it themselves. So that's a good sign that, um, four different farms, including some I hadn't worked with yet, have reached out to say they want to do this and we're setting up a, a plan for them to do it themselves. Um, and horticultural soaps and oils, um, uh, I, I don't know, I don't have numbers there, but I do. Um, one of the key things there is that it, it probably doesn't pencil out very well to, to cover the entire crop and that's it, because that does really add up. Um, but that's one of the benefits of, um, or one of the, the reasons that it's important to scout and to find the, the hot spots and to target those hot spots where, where they're um, where they're still getting established. 
Great, thank you. And we have a couple of questions for Jason. Uh, the first uh, from Vijay Nandula is, uh, can you spot treat manure patches with insecticides? Um, is it even doable or economical? Thanks for your question, Vijay. Um, I, I guess the honest answer is I don't know if it's economical. Um, you know, I'm sure you could apply enough pesticide in any one spot to make an effect on fly emergence, um, but there is a lot of labor involved in that. Um, nor would I suggest that hand spreading uh, manure pads is a, an economical option either. Uh, although our hope would be that if it worked, then it could scale up with a you know a vehicle drag that's mechanized. Um, I think yeah, I'll stop there. I know there was another question. Yeah, there's actually two more. Uh, so one is, uh, do you think that spreading increased the surface area for oviposition? That. I, I do, I do. Although we have to bear in mind, horn flies and face flies are very picky, and they like to be the very first insects to lay their eggs in the manure. Um, probably for a couple of reasons, right? Warm manure has a temperature benefit of promoting metabolic rates, and so they might get a jump on development that way. And also, um, there's a race to develop before the predators move in and before the resources used up. So um, we honestly didn't expect an increase in flies after spreading the manure because from what I've read, they're only supposed to be laying their eggs in the first, you know, within the first 15 minutes for horn flies and within, you know, the first hours for face flies. So it was surprising that face flies are, are there. But that said, face flies are less picky than horn flies. So the fact that they normally will oviposit up to a few hours means that maybe they're not so concerned about how warm the, the manure is. Maybe they're just looking for a fresh surface. And in that, if that's true, then possibly we facilitated their oviposition by coming back the next day and scraping off the crust. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, two more questions by David. Uh, could running chickens in pastures reduce fly emergence and do chickens eat the fly eggs? Um, chickens eat the fly larvae. The eggs are really quite small, um, but I, I've heard really good things about running chickens in pastures. And it takes a big flock to clean up behind uh, the, your, your cattle. So, you know, for some farmers, that's simply not feasible. But if you have a system where you have enough uh, chickens to follow your, your pastures, I think that it can, in fact, have a really good effect on suppressing flies. Great. And um, Nancy had a question for uh, Chang Lu. And um, uh, Nancy, would you like to ask it? Oh, uh, sure. So Chang Lu, um, the, the re rebound of 26% mouse increasement uh, after your, your pro protocol was finished, that just shows that apartment management has to keep up with a high level of treatments? And secondarily, do you think that 26% uh, increase is due to infill once the population was dropped or why why that, that big increase after you were done? Uh, yeah, good question. So uh, that building in Trenton has some uh, issues in the exterior doors. So they have to seal the doors and the gaps so that uh, the mouse will not invade the building. The increase is a result of, uh, most likely, is a result of invasion of the house mouse from the outside. So that means exterior exclusion should be implemented in the IPM programs. And also, you know, periodically monitoring departments will be also necessary. Great, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right, perfect timing. So um, we will carry on with our last two presentations. Uh, the first is by Veronica Yurchak, and um, it is creating an eco-friendly pest suppression program in sweet corn. Um, Veronica is with the University of Maryland, and this was funded by Northeast Sir. Hello, my name is Veronica Yurchak, and I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Entomology at the University of Maryland. And today I'm going to be speaking a little bit about some of the work done by my advisor, Dr. Saridi Hooks, 
as well as Alan Leslie, who is a county agent with the University of Maryland's Extension Service. And in this project, we were investigating the potential use of marigold border plantings to enhance insect natural enemy populations within sweet corn. And so our three main objectives for the study were to assess the attractiveness of marigold to insect natural enemies, to determine how marigold plantings might influence insect natural enemies in adjacent sweet corn plantings, and then to quantify the ear damage in sweet corn bordered both by these marigold plantings compared to just an extension of that bare ground. And so our experimental design for this study was pretty straightforward. We had two treatments, um, sweet corn that was either bordered by strips of marigold or just by bare ground. And these two treatments were replicated four times. And so just to give you a visual of what those two treatments look like, again, we had 16 rows of sweet corn and in the marigold treatment, those were bordered by strips of marigold flowers. And in the control, those marigold flowers just weren't present. So it was just an extension of the bare ground that the sweet corn was planted into. And so we addressed our objectives through a number of different sampling methods. Um, but today I'm just gonna focus on talking about the results from our yellow sticky cards, which were placed in three locations in the border area. So either in the bare ground or in the marigold itself between rows two and three. So towards the border rows of those sweet corn plantings and then in the plot center. And so looking first at just predators in general seen on those yellow sticky cards, um, we have mean number of predators on the y-axis and then our two treatments, either the check or the control treatment or the marigold treatment. And I wanna look first here on the right at the marigold treatment. Um, so what we saw was that there were significantly greater numbers of predators in the border rows of the sweet corn. So between rows two and three, than there were in the plot center. Um, and those weren't different than what was seen in the marigold itself. Um, so at, at first that might seem like maybe the marigold is enhancing the number of predators, at least in the areas closest to the marigold itself. Um, but if we look at the control treatment, those weren't actually, uh, what we saw in the border rows of the marigold wasn't significantly different than what we saw in the sweet corn in the control. So it almost actually looks more like the marigold was attracting the predators away from the center of the plot and out towards the borders, border rows of the sweet corn plot and then into the marigold itself. If we look at the numbers of parasitoids seen, so, here we again have our control treatment first, followed by the marigold treatment. And I'd like to focus on the marigold treatment first again. Um, so what we saw with parasitoids was that there were significantly more parasitoids in the center of the plot than there were towards the edges of the sweet corn plot. But that in the center of the plot, this was not significantly different from what we were seeing in the marigold itself. Um, and these greater numbers of parasitoids seen in the marigold were not significantly different from what we saw within the sweet corn plot of the control treatment. So again, it looks more like that marigold may have been attractive to the natural enemies, but like maybe those natural enemies more towards the border of the plot were attracted out into the marigold rather than again, greater numbers of natural enemies being seen in the marigold treatment itself. Um, so based on these results, we are going to continue to investigate the potential for marigold to be used as a companion plant, but we wouldn't necessarily recommend its use at this point for enhancing pest control in sweet corn systems. Um, and so with that, thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions at the, the live portion of this meeting. Thank you very much, Veronica. And our last presentation is by uh, Christy Hoptig. And um, the uh, uh, topic is testing ground barriers for Swede Midge IPM on at risk small scale brassica farms. It was funded by Northeast SARE. And um, Christy's with the uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Orleans County. 
My name is Christy Hopeding. I am an extension educator with the Cornell Vegetable Program in New York. My co-PI is Yolanda Chen with the, part, the Department of Entomology at UVM. And I'm gonna share highlights from our Northeast IPM Partnership Project, testing ground barriers for Swedemage IPM on at-risk small-scale brassica farms. The Swedemage is a tiny fly that it attacks exclusively brassica crops and it lays its eggs in the growing points of the plants and that's where the larvae feed. The saliva of the larva is toxic to brassica plants and causes leaf puckering, multiple growing points, brown corky scarring, unmarketable heads, or blind heads. Because this type of symptom can be caused by other factors, it is important to find the sweet midge in association with damage to confirm that you have sweet midge. I want to give a quick shout out to a one minute di diagnostic video that I made a couple of years ago to walk you through how to find a sweet midge larvae in a brassica planting. What is important to know about the sweet midge life cycle is that it overwinters in the soil as pupa in the spring. It emerges as adults, which mate within three days, lay eggs, the larvae hatch and feed for seven to 21 days, then drop to the soil to pupate, and then adults emerge in another seven to 14 days. In New York, there are three to five overlapping generations per season, which begin in mid-May and extend through the end of October. Managing Swede midge is all about disrupting its life cycle with the most effective strategies being the use of systemic conventional insecticides and far and wide crop rotation, the farther the better. However, work that I did a few years ago on small scale organic brassica farms showed that a grower could return to an infested field the following year provided that they waited until the spring emergence had subsided before they grew their brassica crop. So generally, Swedemidge has not reached economical levels in conventional brassica production. Alternatively, small-scale organic farms are at greater risk for Swedemidge because organic insecticides are not nearly as good as conventional insecticides, and they tend to have a small land base with a high proportion of their acreage crop to brassica crops in multiple planting season long, so the pests can develop to economically damaging levels fairly quickly. Although insect exclusion netting is highly effective, it is often cost prohibitive. This is why we decided to investigate the use of ground barriers as a pragmatic strategy for managing Swedemidge. The ground barriers included plastic mulch, landscape fabric, or tarp sheeting. One of the ways that they could work is if a Swedemidge that was dropping off the plant to the soil to pupate would land on a ground barrier and perish. Laboratory studies at UVM showed that Swedemidge larvae can actually move over the top of ground barriers up to 16 centimeters. So this strategy would not be effective for managing Swedemidge. The other way that ground barriers could work is that if a grower had a fall brassica planting that was infested with Swedemidge and he knew that's where they were gonna be emerging the following spring, that he could cover that ground with a barrier and theoretically grow a susceptible brassica beside it. And the Swede Widge would emerge underneath the ground barrier and perish. So the laboratory studies at UVM showed that Swede Midge emergence was nine times higher when they were exposed to light, but they did emerge in the dark underneath the ground barrier. The next step was to conduct a small cage study outside where we evaluated plastic mulch and landscape fabric, both with and without, without holes, as well as tarp, which we placed over top of artificially inoculated soil that we used laboratory reared Swede midge. And then we quickly learned that the Swede midge emerged through the holes in the ground barrier. So a grower is not gonna be able to plant into a ground barrier, he's gonna have to take the area out of production. But the good news is, is that Swede midge did not emerge after the tarp was removed after 30 days in 2018 and after 46 days in 2019, suggesting that they did emerge and perish underneath the tarp. So now we are conducting a large cage study with ground that is naturally infested with Swede midge because in natural conditions, the Swede midge is going to emerge over a period of several weeks. Within the large cages, we're going to place the ground barriers over naturally infested Swede midge ground, which will include tarp or landscape fabric, and we will remove them after four, eight, or 12 weeks and then broccoli will be grown right beside, so we'll see if we can produce a marketable crop. 
Here is my and Yolanda Chen's contact information and also once again a shout out to our new vegetable fact sheet, new crop rotation recommendations for sweet midge. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Christy. I'm sorry for messing up your last name. Um, so uh, we are right on time actually to end and uh, we have a few things to uh, cover and um, it is not showing up on my screen. Okay, we'll, um, I'll, I'll uh, have it on the fly. So we have a couple of uh, poll with just a couple of quick questions for you, which should pop up on your screen if you're seeing it. And um, if you could just take a, a minute to answer those, that would be wonderful. All right, and I will end the poll. Um, and um, I also want to um, just uh, share with you um, that if you would like to uh, connect with other people that you have presented today, uh, we have a Find a Colleague uh, site where um, you can uh, post a profile and also find other people who are interested in your, um, in your project or in other types of projects and, and topics that you're interested in. Um, there will be a recording of uh, today's um, um, research update conference and also our toolbox series, which is uh, we're undergoing our spring toolboxes at the moment, and that'll be available on our website uh, next week. And I'll also send an email to anyone who's registered for this. Uh, we have uh, some upcoming toolboxes uh, next uh, Wednesday, uh, we're doing a toolbox on uh, pesticides. It's um, offered by the Pest Pesticide Management Program at Cornell. Uh, the following week, we have combating slugs as pests of soybeans and corn. And uh, the following week, um, we're looking at how strawberry disease risk varies with microclimates. And for people who are interested in the last presentation today, we also did one recently on topping. Uh, there was a really interesting uh, presentation about different topping. Um, uh, uh, um, a working group has put out a, um, a, 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 a <laughs> I am tongue tied right now. <laughs> there is a topping working group that has put out a, a booklet on different types of topping and the research that they pulled together that was actually very interesting. All right. Uh, we want to acknowledge uh, that uh, Cornell University is um, on the lands of the Gahoni, and um, which is part of the Haudenosaunee Confederation. And we acknowledge the painful history of dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gahoni people, past, present, uh, to these lands and waters. And this acknowledgement has been reviewed um, and approved by the, the leadership. And we also want to um, acknowledge uh, that this is funded uh, by all of the uh, research uh, that is funded through the Northeast IPM Center, it comes from funding from the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, Crop, Crop Prote Protection and Pest Management uh, Regional Coordination Program. And uh, with that, I thank everybody for their time and presence today and your really interesting presentations and uh, great questions. And thank you everyone for, uh, for coming today. And I hope it was a useful use of your time. Okay, bye-bye.